Well, please do take out your message outline. And uh, we're in this series, as you know, uh, called 2020 Vision. And uh, we're looking, really, uh, about how we see things clearly. We talked a bit about that last week. And if you missed that message, I encourage you to watch it online, watch it on YouTube, uh, really just to catch yourself up with that. But really, what we're doing is we're reminding ourselves, or maybe if we're new to the church, we're just looking at what it is to be a church for all people of all ages, transforming lives for Jesus. That's what we're about. Now, I've been in ministry now for about 23 years or so, and one of the things that I've often studied, one of the things that I've thought about, one of the things I've sort of read about is really this whole question of how does a church grow? Or to put the question another way, what keeps a church from growing? And in seeking to answer that question, I, I've read books, I've spoken to pastors of growing churches, uh, you know, I've thought about these things a lot. And last week, as I said, uh, as an eldership, we really feel that uh, we have a sense that, that God would have us grow as a church, that we might grow larger numerically over these next three years. That's what we were thinking and praying about. That's what we talked a bit about last week. But actually, that we would grow, more importantly, that we would grow through people coming to faith in Christ. Now, I think when you look at this question of how does a church grow, you do have to ask a basic question. You almost need to ask, ask a question before that one, which is, well, does God want the church to grow numerically? Or, or why should the church grow? Or should the church keep on growing? And this is a live issue for us because we are a growing church. Uh, and so I want to talk about the biblical answers to this question of why a church should grow, why that's important. The Bible says in Matthew 13, verse 31, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. Though it is the smallest of all seeds, yet when it grows, it is the largest of garden plants. Well, that obviously implies the kingdom of God, the church of God, is going to grow. Jesus expected the church to grow. And as I said, when I use this term church growth, and that's what we're thinking about this morning, I'm talking about conversion growth. I'm talking about growth that comes from people who come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Faith, that people come to faith that they are converted because they've invited Jesus into their lives. So this morning, I want to give you five biblical reasons why the church must never stop growing. Here's the first one. Because God's word commands it. That's the first reason. God's word commands numerical church growth. Now that's obvious if you read the New Testament, because in the Bible we have clear instructions from Christ about the spread of the gospel. Jesus has given us a mission, he's given us a mandate uh, to go and make disciples. That's known as the Great Commission. And actually there are five Great Commissions in the New Testament. There are one in each one of the four Gospels, and then there's one more in Acts. But the most famous one is in Matthew 28, verses 19 to 20. Jesus said, Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I will be with you always to the very end of the age. Now notice in this passage there are three things. He says, make disciples, mark disciples, mature disciples. First of all, we're to make disciples. That is, we are to win them to Christ and by the Holy Spirit doing a work in their heart and life that they become converted. Then we are to baptise them. That is, as it were, that they are identified as believers. It's a public declaration that when someone is baptised of their faith in Christ. In other words, they are marked, if you like, as a Christian. And thirdly, we're then to help them mature. Notice it says, teach them to obey everything I've commanded you. In other words, we are called to help disciples, people become disciples, to help people mature in Christ. Now that's the Great Commission. That's what we're about. That's what we should about. The danger is, is that many churches today, that's the great omission. They just don't do it. We need to do things, we need to do everything, which is to make, mark, and mature disciples. And yet many churches just do none of that. Now Jesus in each of the Gospels and in the book of Acts gives us a commission to his followers that we are to go out and reach others for Christ. Here's the one in Acts 1 verse 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And here is this idea that Jesus wants to understand that the gospel might expand in ever-increasing concentric circles. In a sense, a ripple effect. He says, first you start in Jerusalem. Well, that was where they were in that area. Then he says, go to Judea. Well, that's in their country. Then he says to Samaria, that's the neighboring country. And then he says, to the very ends of the world world. In other words, Jesus is saying he wants the gospel, the message of Christ, the message of the gospel to grow 
and to grow and to grow and to begin to make disciples and they were to start in their home base where they were and eventually it would expand to the entire globe. That's what Acts 1.8 tells us. And I think these representative verses and many others that I could point you to point to the fact that it is our responsibility to help the church grow, to work for church growth, to believe in church growth. I don't think it's optional for a church because it is commanded. In fact, I believe that the church that refuses to reach out to unbelievers is a, disobe is a disobedient church. I actually think that a church is sinning. And to ignore these commandments is sin because Jesus says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Even in situations where churches perhaps are in areas in parts of the world where it's prohibited to reach out, I still think an obedient church will still have a desire to share the faith, a desire to keep growing. Now, they need to be wise about how they do that, but I think that there is a desire to do so. And interestingly, in many parts of the world where the church is being persecuted, it is growing in unbelievable ways, isn't it? So we are commanded that we reach out, that we grow. Secondly, the church must never stop growing because of the needs of the people. <clears throat> the needs of the people around us demand that the church grows. And the Bible clearly states that people who die without Christ will go to hell. That's what the Bible says. It's a reality that we cannot ignore. It has been estimated, in fact, that 155,000 people will die every 24 hours. Most of those people are dying without Christ. And we need to continually remind ourselves of this eternal fact that eternal punishment awaits those who die without Christ and eternal reward awaits those who die in Christ. Here's Matthew 25, 41, 46. Then God will say, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. They will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. That's what we're talking about here, isn't it? These consequences are eternal consequences. And this is a fact that motivates us here at CEC to never stop reaching out. See, as long as there is one person in our area who is headed for hell, then we must continue to reach out with the good news. We will never stop growing as long as there's just one person who needs Christ. We will continue to reach out, and you need to know this, whether this is your first Sunday here or you've been here for many, many years. We will never stop reaching out. We don't grow for our benefit, but we grow for the benefit of other people. We grow because people need Christ, don't they? We grow because people without Christ go to hell. It's the clear teaching of the Bible. And in fact, it is selfish for a church to not want to grow. A church that says, hey, well, you know, um, we've got enough people. We've got a nice fellowship. Our church is just about the right size. Uh, we just need to focus on the people that we already have. That church, in reality, is actually saying, well, you know, the rest of the world can go to hell because we don't care. The church that only focuses on itself rather than on the needs of the people in their area, the people that they know, those in the world who are lost, really simply have just become a social club. I think it's selfish for a church to not want to grow. Now, the flip side of that is I actually think that the, it's unselfish for a church to want to grow. Now, let me tell you, increased growth means more problems. It means bigger problems. It means more people, which means more potential problems. It means more inconveniences, more conflicts, more expenses, more frustration. It also, may, also means additional time demands on me as the pastor and the elders and all the volunteer church leadership. And at times, church growth is costly. It's costly. It's sacrificial. But the church that commits itself to growth is acting in unselfish ways. By your own commitment, you as a church family, we as a church family are saying we are willing to put up with the hassles of growth. We're going to welcome new people into our fellowship because we know people need Christ. And that's key. This is a key issue. Now, not only is the command of Christ telling us that we must reach out, but also the needs of other people. Uh, look what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, verse 14. For Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all. Now, love is the proper motivation for church growth. Not anything else, but love. Love for the Lord and love for people. 
And I believe that a church must choose to grow or not to grow. Many churches actually have deliberately chosen not to grow. They may not say that, but they make that choice in a variety of ways. They make it by the programs they offer. They make it by the amount of time they invest in evangelism. They make decisions by the side of the building that perhaps they choose to build. See, God gives us the freedom of choice whether or not we want to grow numerically. But if we really love God and we really love people, then our desire for church growth can't be an optional extra should be part of our DNA. Think about it. How loving would I be if I had the cure for cancer? Instead of sharing it with as many people as I could, I would simply form a little small club of people that I liked and just shared the secret only with them. You know, we sat around and we talked about it. That would be unloving, wouldn't it? That would be selfish. And yet, to keep the good news of Jesus to myself, which is so desperately needed by this needy world, by people that we know, is the most unloving thing I can do. And I think the world is much more ready to receive the gospel than we are actually ready to share it, you know. And the Bible says that I'm accountable for who I share the good news with. Because God places people in our lives, he's given us people that we have the opportunity to share Christ with, and we are accountable for whether or not we do that. The needs of people around us demand that we reach out to them. Thirdly, the church must never stop growing because Jesus believed in church growth. And if you don't believe that, then you misunderstand Jesus. He is committed to the ch- growth of his church. He clearly expresses it here in Matthew 16 and 18. He says to Peter, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not overcome it. So building is a term that devi- de- implies development or expansion or growth. Not only that, but in this verse, we notice that the growth agent of the church is Jesus Christ himself. It's his church, and he wants it to grow. And as you look at the life and the teaching of Christ, you find that he was very conscious that the Gospels would spread beyond Palestine. That numerous times he makes reference to, uh, in the Gospels to the expansion of his teaching, to the expansion of the Gospel, to the expansion of the Kingdom of God all around the world. Look, in Matthew 5, 13 to 14, he says, you are the salt of the earth, you are the light of the world. It implies universal growth of the Gospel. It is going to go into the whole world. Matthew 8, 11 says, Many will come from the east and the west and take their place at the feast with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. In other words, they're going to come from all over the place. In Matthew 24, 14, he says, And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And again, Matthew 26, 13, talking about the woman who'd been anointed by Jesus, he says, Wherever this gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Jesus has, as it were, a world vision. That is very clear that Jesus intended for there to be disciples all over the place, all over the world, and expected that that expansion to happen. And as followers of Christ, we need to be committed to the very same vision that Jesus had for the spread of the gospel. Because if we say we want to be more like Jesus, well, Jesus had a world vision, didn't he? He had a heart for people. He had a heart that people might know him. And even more powerful than Jesus' teaching on growth was his personal example of the priority of reaching out. So repeatedly, Jesus told us what his purpose on earth was. That was to bring people into fellowship with God. Luke 19.10, he says, For the Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost. We looked at it last Sunday evening, in fact. If we're going to be like Jesus, we are going to seek and save that which was lost. And so like Jesus, our goal should be, must be, will be, is to reach those who don't know the Lord. Fourthly, the church must never stop growing because the nature of the church itself implies growth. The nature of the church itself implies growth, both numerically and spiritually. In Colossians 2.19, we have a very clear statement that it's for God's will for the church to continue to grow. Under Christ's control, the whole body is nourished and held together by its joints and ligaments, and it grows as God wants it to grow. It is God's will for the church to grow, both numerically and spiritually. He desires its growth. He wants it to grow. He plans for it. He intends for it to grow. Now, the most used term in the Bible for the church is this phrase, the body of Christ. And the church is a body. It's not a business, it's a body. Therefore, that means that the church is alive. It is a living organism. It's not an organization, but a living organism. The Bible says in Ephesians that it is a body under his direction. 
Therefore, the whole body is fitted together perfectly. Each part, in its own special way, helps the other part so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. That's the ideal. And notice that the concept of health and growth go together when you're talking about the church. Healthy churches grow. All live things grow. In fact, growth is the evidence of life, isn't it? Now, whilst I'm talking primarily this morning about numerical growth, it's also important to notice spiritual growth is just as important as numerical growth. So don't mishear me here. See, if a child doesn't grow up, that's a tragedy, isn't it? And if a believer doesn't grow to spiritual maturity, that, again, is a great tragedy. God wants you to grow. If you're a Christian, he wants you, he expects you to, to mature spiritually. Ephesians 4, 14 to 15 says this. Then we will no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of men in their deceitful scheming. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into him who is the head, that is Christ. Let me show you in the J.B. Phillips version of those verses because he puts it this way. We are not meant to remain as children as at the mercy of every chance wind of teaching, but we are meant to hold firmly to the truth in love and to grow up in every way into Christ the head. Notice this verse talks about truth and love. They're both important, that we are to grow up in every way. That is the model of perfect maturity, isn't it? That we might become mature in Christ. That each one of us might become more like Christ. That we learn to think like Christ, to act like Christ, to feel like Christ, to talk like him. Now, as your pastor, I think a lot about your spiritual maturity. And one of the things that bothers me is that people can go to church their entire life and still be spiritually immature. They could have been in church for, for, for 20, 30, 40, 50 years plus, and they're still cranky. You know, they're still self-righteous. They're still critical. They're unloving. They gossip. And I I don't understand, how is it that they can hear many, many sermons, they can be under Bible teaching year after year after year, and they just don't grow? Why is that? But, But when you have a church that is spiritually growing, it then grows numerically. Here's the thing, you may not realize this, but your spiritual maturity impacts the growth of this church. How? Because the more you grow to be like Jesus, the more loving you will be, the more passionate you will be about God, you will be more concerned for lost people. Because you will be more and more like Christ. So we must have a passion to win lost people for Jesus. And I'm not going to stop encouraging you to do that and challenging you to reach out. But equally, at the same time, we must grow deeper spiritually. In fact, that's the first part of our church's vision statement. Here it is. It is the vision of this church to share the good news of Jesus with our community, to give the thousands of people in our area repeated opportunities to hear and respond to Jesus Christ. Now notice, to be a church that is, notice, spiritually deep and numerically growing. That's what we're about. Spiritually deep and numerically growing. In fact, Paul tells us in Colossians 1.28, we continue to preach Christ to each person using all wisdom to warn and to teach everyone. Well, that is the outreach. That is the importance of numerical growth. But why do we do this? Is it just to get numbers? No, here's the reason, Paul says, in order to bring each one into God's presence as a mature person in Christ. We go make disciples, don't we? That we reach as many people as possible for Jesus and help them grow to become like Fifthly, the church must never stop growing because the New Testament demonstrates numerical church growth. Now, this is the reason why the church ought to grow, because they grew in the New Testament. If we say we pattern ourselves after the New Testament church, then we should be growing. We see an amazing example of numerical growth in the very first church, the church in Jerusalem. And the incredible growth rate at Jerusalem is recorded in the book of Acts. And I want to take you through some of these, and I think this is thrilling. Because at the beginning of the book of Acts, the number of disciples, the number of followers of Christ was about 120. Acts 1.15 says, In those days, Peter stood up among the believers, a group numbering about 120. Now, from that day forward, from the day of Pentecost forward, we can see the rapid growth of Jerusalem church. So in Acts 2.41, it tells us that. This is after uh, after Peter's preached this incredible message. Those who accepted his message were baptized, 
and about 3,000 were added to the number that day. Now, that's incredible growth for one day. Could you imagine if that happened one day? Might have to have a lay down after that one. Then look, it's amazing, isn't it? I mean, just, just look at what this is, okay? Then look, in Acts 2.47, it then says, the Lord added to the number daily those who are being saved. So, okay, so that means a minimum of 365 new converts a year. Now, that would be cool, wouldn't it? Every year, you go, 365 people come to church, come to faith in Christ, and then join this church. Amazing. Now, so, let me remind you, we see the first 120 in the upper room, then the first day, as it were, the official church, when the Spirit comes, 3,000 people are added to the church, then it says the Lord added to their number daily. Okay, got the numbers in your mind, if you're good at maths? Now look, Acts 4.4, 4, many who heard the message believed, and the number of men grew to about 5,000. Now, let me explain what this means, because it's referring here, uh, the word here is referring to adult males, not men in the generic sense. So, it says that there actually were 5,000 men in the church. Now, whenever you have 5,000 males, you're going to have at least five to 10,000 females, and maybe five to 10,000 children, because they would have come as families. The men are mentioned here because of the way that the New Testament is written. So, a number of Bible scholars believe, in fact, that by Acts 4, verse 4, the Jerusalem church had as many as, many as 25,000 members. Acts 5, 14 says, Nevertheless, more and more men and women believed in the Lord and were added to their number. Now, in Acts 5, 28, Peter and the apostles were taken to the Sanhedrin, remember, we read that passage earlier on, and this is what the Sanhedrin said, we gave you strict orders not to teach in his name, yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. Now, what a great testimony that is, isn't it? You filled Jerusalem with your teaching. The church had grown so much that the message of the gospel had completely penetrated Jerusalem. I mean, that's church growth, isn't it? Now look at Acts 6, verse 1 says, In those days when the number of disciples was increasing, verse 7, the word of God spread, the number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. So now you're going to the real high hierarchy of, of, of Judaism. And there's one other reference to the growth of the Jerusalem church. It's Acts 21, verse 20. It's approximately AD 58 or 59 or thereabouts. So that's about 25 years later. And we have an indication of the size of the Jerusalem church after approximately 25 years of growth since Pentecost. It says, when they heard this, they praised God. Then they said to Paul, you see, brother, how many thousands of Jews have believed. And the word for many thousands in the Greek is literally translated tens of thousands. The church had gotten so large, it numbered in the tens of thousands. So, just get this a minute. From these verses, we see tremendous growth in just a quarter of a century. So, by the time... Paul has arrived in Jerusalem in around about AD 59. The church has grown so much that the number of believers can only be estimated in tens of thousands. Now, how many were there? Well, it's quite interesting. The number of Bible scholars estimate that by this time, the church at Jerusalem had grown to 100,000 people, at least. Now, what's incredible about this is that Jerusalem at that time was approximately 200,000 inhabitants. So what's incredible is that means that half the city had been converted. Now, the, the statement that the high priest makes, the disciples of filled Jerusalem with their teaching, is probably the understatement of the century, isn't it? One out of every two people was a member of the Jerusalem church. Isn't that incredible? Don't miss that. You know, if we know our Bibles well, we just go, oh, yeah, yeah. That's incredible. 25 years, around 100,000 people at least, and the church has grown. What does Jesus say? I will build my church. So, numerical growth is the norm for New Testament church. Now, let me, they're the five biblical reasons that I wanted to share with you this morning about why we should not stop growing. But here's the thing. <clears throat> so, let me deal with these things. Because sometimes people say, yeah, yeah, yeah. But, you know, they throw a few arguments up about why the church um, shouldn't grow. Or, the, or they're against any emphasis on numerical growth. Because it's all about spiritual growth. Here's the three arguments that are often put up, and I'll answer them. First of all, God isn't interested in numbers. And normally, that argument is put forward because it's a reaction against sort of this idea of statistics and measuring church growth. 
That also implies that those who do such things are unspiritual, that they're only interested in numbers because it's good for their ego. The pastor wants to feel good about himself. He wants to have lots of people come and sort of worship at his feet every Sunday uh, and be in awe. Uh, that's what some people think. But actually, when you look at the Bible, that argument really has no basis at all because in the first place, several times in the Old Testament, God gave specific instructions for the Israelites to be counted. So, for example, during the Exodus, they took a census at both the beginning and the end of the Exodus. They counted everybody. Why? Well, because God wanted to know who was there. God wanted to know how they had grown. Now, he obviously knew because he's God. But he also wanted to know, them to know who was there and who wasn't there. He wanted to know who had come through and who'd been lost in the wilderness. Now, when you get to the New Testament, you will find many of the illustrations in the story that Jesus told involve counting. Remember, he talks about the fishermen who count their fish, shepherds who count their sheep, businessmen who count their investments, the king who counted his soldiers before he went into battle. Certainly, Jesus saw nothing unspiritual about counting. In fact, he considers it wise. Because in the parable of the lost sheep, we only have to ask the question, how did the shepherd know that one of his sheep were missing? Because he counted. When he discovered that 99 were in the fold, he knew one was missing. And rather than saying, well, I've got 99, that's all right, forget about the one that's missing, he went out and looked for the individual sheep, didn't he? So there's nothing unspiritual about counting numbers. Here's the thing, every week as an elder team, we count. We take notice of who's here and who's not here. Now, that don't make you feel guilty about that because you think, oh, no, I'm not going to be here next Sunday and they will know. Um, well, we will know, but, you know, um, it, it, it's not because of that. It's because we care. We care about who's not here. We care who's missing. You see, we count people because people count. And every number represents a person. It's not about big numbers in that sense. It's about you individuals. And you need to know, when you're not here, we miss you. We really do. Even where we are now in two morning congregations, and it's harder for us to do this, actually, and that's what we keep saying to you, fill in the connect card, so we know that if you're not around for a little bit, we know that. Or if something's going on, tell us. That's why we do these things. But, but we generally do miss you if you're not here. You're needed. You need to be present. As I said last Sunday, make Sunday mornings, make Sunday services, three services, more, whatever one you come in the morning or in the evening, make them a priority. Second reason people say we shouldn't necessarily be worried about numbers is because our church wants quality, not quantity. And here is this whole, this whole false conflict about the size and character of the church implying that you can't have both at the same time. Now, why it's true that bigger is not necessarily better, neither is it true that smaller is necessarily better. Quality and quantity do not have to be enemies. So as a pastor, I don't think I have to choose between the two, do I? Uh, it's not a matter of either or. See, Jesus' first words to his disciples in Mark 1.17 says, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. Let me press that illustration a little bit further. You've heard me say this before. Uh, when a fishman goes fishing, does he want quality or does he want quantity? Well, he wants both, doesn't he? He wants to catch the biggest fish he can, and he wants to catch loads of them. And so, therefore, I don't think these two things are an enemy. Sometimes quality produces quantity, and sometimes quantity produces quality. We want both, don't we? Quality and quantity. And third one, this is often the argument that's used a lot, large churches are impersonal. Now, my answer to that is that they don't have to be. The average church member knows 60 people, whether there is 100, 500, 5,000 people in the church. That's basically what people know. Now, you don't have to know everybody in church to feel like it's still your church, but you do need to know somebody. That's why we believe that a church has to grow larger and smaller at the same time. Now, we need to grow larger. There's, we're never going to stop trying to grow larger on a Sunday, and this building won't stop us doing that. If we have to make decisions and tough decisions about it, we will do so. But we won't allow the church building to stop the growth numerically. But equally, we want people to be connected to one with each other. That's why small groups are more and more important now the larger we get. You need to be in a small group where you can connect with other people, where you can know a group of, say, 10, 12 people or whatever it is, where they know you, you know them, you're prayed for, you encourage each other, you build each other up, because you need that. We need that. When you're sick, when there's things going on in your life, your small group knows that, and they get involved. 
And I think large churches become large simply because they're friendly. A large church doesn't necessarily make it, more unfri- make it unfriendly uh, any more than a small church makes it friendly. I've been in plenty of small churches that are really unfriendly, aren't they? You've been in those? Sometimes I was, in fact, the preacher, which isn't very nice. I actually think big churches get big because actually they are friendly. And the number one reason that often is filled in, and you've heard me say this many times before, the reason why people fill in on their Connect cards, why they, what attracted them to church, what was the first impressions is, I was felt welcome. Now, we don't get that right all the time, but nine times out of ten, we get on the cards, it's a welcoming church. So well done. Size has nothing to do with warmth, whether large or small. So let me close by six quick things that we can do to help the church grow. Because it's all very well saying, okay, this is all well and good. What do we need to do? Now, here's really important. It's not what I should do as as the pastor, or what we should do as an eldership. We, the church, is you and me. We all have a responsibility. We are all part of the family of God. We're all part of the church. We therefore all must own this. This is our responsibility. Number one, be intentional about your spiritual growth. You must make a choice to grow as a Christian if you're a Christian. Spiritual growth is a choice. I don't know how to say it any clearer than this. You are close as God. You are as close to God as you choose to be. If you feel far away from God, that's your choice. God hasn't moved. God is there available for you at all times. There are times when God might be silent, but it doesn't mean to say that you can still be close to God and still not hear his voice at times. Let me ask you, how have you grown spiritually in the last year? It's an interesting question to ask yourself, isn't it? How have you grown spiritually? Are you intentional about your spiritual growth? What do you do personally to grow? If you just come on a Sunday and think, that's all I need for my spiritual growth, well, you won't grow very fast, and you won't grow very deep. You need to be intentional about your own spiritual growth. What are you doing about that? And we'll help you. We're committed to developing tools and resources to help you grow, but you have to be intentional. You need to make the effort, is what I'm saying. And don't downplay this, not just for your own benefit, but your spiritual growth also affects the growth of this church, numerically. Number two, ask God where he wants you to serve. Ask him to give you an understanding of your role as the body of Christ. Remember, God has given you gifts and talents and abilities unique to you that are not there for you to make a great career and make loads of money and be successful. No, he's given them to you so that you might build up the body of Christ, the church. He wants you to serve because each one of you have a part to play. I wonder, where are you serving? Don't sit on the sidelines Churches, you might think there's lots of people involved. No, 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 there is more opportunities. There are more needs. There are more things that need to be done. And a lot of stuff behind the scenes, by the way. Sometimes you might say, well, I don't know where to serve. Well, just say you're available. And sometimes God says, ah, great, now you can serve here. Thirdly, do you do this? Pray for the growth of our church. When's the last time you prayed that the church might grow? Numerically and spiritually. Do you pray for that? You should. Do you pray for our elders? Do you pray for our deacons? Do you pray for our leaders of our ministries? Do you pray for me as your pastor? We need your prayers. We haven't got enough brains to work it out ourselves, so we need your help. When's the last time you prayed for the growth of this church? Fourthly, join a small group. I've already said about that. It's important to do so. Small groups are the heartbeat, or should be the heartbeat of this church. Get on the ground floor of a small group where people know you and you know others. Number five, make a prayer list of people you know who need the Lord. Now, why do I say that? Well, you won't reach very many people unless you get them on your heart, first of all. You pray for people that you know don't know Christ? Make a list. Think about who you could pray for. People that you know, that you see on a regular basis, that need Christ. And then number six, ask God to help you bring at least one person to Christ in the next 12 months. How cool would that be? That God gives you the privilege and the opportunity to be there when someone crosses from darkness to light, when someone comes to Christ. Imagine being in heaven and someone comes up to you and says, hey, thank you, because you shared Jesus with me. I'm here. See, God has placed us as a church in an era of tremendous potential. The fields are white under harvest. The growth limitation we have is only the limitations we put on ourselves. And we need to grow. 
And I think as a church, we've chosen to do that. And it's costly, and it's sacrificial, but these are the things that we need to do. Because again, a Jerusalem church grew and grew and filled the whole area with the gospel. Wouldn't that be great? That we grew and grew, that we shared Christ, the gospel went out, so that in this area, people said, wow, they knew about Jesus, they'd heard about Jesus. That actually people accused us because we'd filled the whole area with the gospel of Christ. Don't let anybody give you, ever give you excuses that God doesn't want the church to grow. Jesus said, I will build my church. He wants it to grow. And we can be a part of that. Let's pray before we come around the Lord's table. And our Father, we thank you that uh, Jesus died so that the church could begin. Christ died for the church. And Father, we thank you that as we come around the Lord's table now, we can reflect on the saving work of God in our own lives, but also how the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ continues and must continue to go out as we seek to make disciples. Lord, we thank you for your saving work in our lives. In Jesus' name.